Good afternoon, evening, morning, wherever you guys are. Um, welcome, everybody. Happy to be here again doing the live Q&A thing. Um, let's see here. Let's check something. All right, it looks cool. I think I'm finally dialing in this whole crazy system that I have going on here. Um, anyways, welcome. Uh, glad you're here, as I said before. Here to take questions. Uh, this is uh, module 10. I'm losing track, guys. <laughs> Uh, no, sorry, module nine. I'm always like a few, I'm always one module ahead. So module nine, this is about winter growing is what we're gonna be taking questions on. And like usual, I will take questions on the module and then take general questions, whatever you guys wanna talk about. And I'll hang out for an hour, an hour and a half, uh, whatever, whatever, uh, whatever you guys need me here for today, I'm here for you. So uh, before we get started, as usual, just a huge thanks to Diego and Paperpod Co for sponsoring the entire course and these live sessions. They've uh, made the whole thing possible, and for me to put this whole course together and give away for free, um, I really couldn't do without them. So go check out what they have for sale, uh, equipment, supplies, and stuff like that, and then Diego's podcasts, uh, Farm Small, Farm Smart, and uh, Care Cash Flow. And there's also written supplements for this course at paperpot.co slash josh. So go check out all that stuff, and uh, definitely thank them and, and um, for their support and involvement. So uh, huge thanks to Diego and, and the team over there. So. Anyways, um, hopefully you guys have been enjoying the course. Um, this last module was about winter growing, which I know didn't really line up because we're coming out of winter growing, but I had to get it in there somewhere into the course as like a package. And um, yeah, I mean, I don't feel like we're, we're I, hopefully here we're, we're done with the freezes um, just because usually here in Raleigh, uh, we we're done usually mid April, but last year, I think it was last year we had a freeze in like late, like early, or sorry, mid to late May. So it was crazy. Um, and many, many of you guys are probably not out of there yet, but just want to get that module in and see if you guys had questions. I know there was a bunch of questions about low tunnels after the tunnels module, which I talked about in this, in this winter growing module, but also, uh, we talked about in the last live Q and A. So yeah, let me know what questions you have here and uh, I'll hop in the chat here and I'm here just to answer questions and hang out. Uh, as, I get, as I said before, we'll take questions on winter growing and then open up for general questions, so. Nice pizza. Uh, oh. <laughs> oh, I didn't know that, okay. I haven't been watching Richard lately. Um, yeah, that's interesting. Well, I get most of my music from Epidemic Sound, which a lot of people have subscriptions to. Um, that's how we have like all, if you watch YouTube, um, most of the creators are paying for a monthly subscription to places like Epidemic or Artlist. Um, there's a couple other places too. And uh, if you actually watch a lot of YouTube, you'll hear the same songs. <laughs> there's a huge library of music, but we all tend to like the same stuff, I guess. I don't know, but that's interesting. Hi, Ing Inger. Uh, welcome. Austria. Hi, Sarah. Welcome. Jay's in the house. <laughs> hey, Jay. Tip Sports, thank you so much. What is the hardest part of winter growing? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, I think there's a couple things that are hard. I don't think there's one thing that's the hardest part, but I think that one of the hardest parts is getting your crop planning sorted uh, and making sure you plant stuff early enough because when you're coming out of summer and things are growing quick, you're like not thinking about uh, the time between crops. And I think that's one of the trickiest parts because you're coming out of summer, especially if it's your first season, you kind of get the sense of the pace. And then all of a sudden, for us here, it's always around Halloween where the light and heat just kind of drops and things slow down real fast. And so, if things aren't like fairly big uh, going into like, uh, for me, that that's usually the time frame that it happens uh, around Halloween, then everything after that really slows down and anything you plant after that takes like way longer. So that's one of the biggest challenges. The other one I find with winter growing is um, it, it needs constant attention, but not the same as in the summer. So you're always monitoring temperatures in the tunnel, opening, closing, ventilating, and just being really careful about that. Like you could have a streak of four or five days where it stays above freezing every night and then you just 
maybe you get used to it and then you don't check the weather and then one night it drops below freezing and you didn't have things covered. So you just have to like constantly pay attention to it because if it's not gonna go below freezing at night, like I'm gonna leave the tunnels open. So I think it's a lot of that kind of stuff. It's a lot of this like little maintenance that you just kind of have to stay on top of um, and those sorts of things. Hopefully that answered your question. I don't think there's like one hard part. I don't think it's generally challenging overall. I think it's just, it's a very different pace and it's something to get used to. And the other thing is if you're somewhere where it's much colder than I am, winter going can be a lot more challenging. Like if you have a lot more snow, like you have to go out and clear tunnels on a regular basis and those sorts of things. So I think it depends on where you are too. For me, those are kind of my my things. Uh, we get like one snowstorm usually a year and it's in between like one and five inches or whatever. I think one year we got like eight inches. It was pretty crazy. So anyways, yeah, those are, those are the things that I, I think about. Um, also just like if you have to go out, it, it's kind of like, the, I'm giving you a lot of reasons, a lot of things here, but sometimes on the really cold day, there's only like a certain amount of hours where you can really go out there and harvest and work because Sorry, not work. Like I, I'm, I'm happy working out in the cooler weather, but like, if it's a really cold night and it's your harvest day, you kind of have to wait for the the tunnels to warm up and the crops to kind of warm up. Sometimes they're they're not looking great first thing in the morning because they need to warm up, and so you have to wait, and so you have to time things a little bit better. Or maybe you have to really look at the weather and, um, like maybe harvest the day before or two days before. So it's a lot of like planning and just paying attention, but it's just a different pace and something to get used to. So thanks for the question, just Ed. Let's just scroll down too far. Tiny House, welcome, glad you're here. Are the double layer, Sarah's asking here, are the double layer of tunnels with the air blown in between better? So uh, one of my tunnels, which is the nursery, so the three Caterpillar tunnels are from Farmer's Friend, those are single walled, the double walled greenhouse I have does have a little blower. And if you're not familiar with double walled greenhouses, basically there's two layers of plastic, which is a serious pain when you set it up, but it's doable. And then there's a little blower motor that runs all the time. It just keeps it inflated. So you have like a little pocket of air uh, between two pieces of plastic and it insulates it quite a bit. And yeah, it does make a big difference. Um, and I was curious when I got that tumble from Rimmel about the end walls and they said, no, don't worry about the end walls because those are single wall that the heat generally is escaping through the roof. So uh, I was surprised the end walls weren't like double walled or something else. Um, but yeah, it it's definitely warm in there. Like it, 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 I think it makes a difference for sure. I think it just traps a little bit more heat, um, obviously, because you have that insulated layer. Because if you think about a normal tunnel with one piece of plastic, like there's not much insulating value with a piece of plastic, right? And so the tunnel will heat up during the day and you close it late afternoon, try to have as much heat in there, try to warm up the soil as much as possible and the air that's in there, but um, it does cool down pretty quickly um, once the sun goes down. So um, yeah, I mean, it, it's definitely cool. Uh, it's They're definitely more expensive. Um, you have to have electricity running out there as well. And it's another thing to like manage and stuff, but yeah, they're, it's super cool. What's up, Gene? How do I deal with slugs and low tunnels? I haven't had too much of an issue with slugs here. I know some people do. Um, I don't know. I haven't had too much of an issue with that, so I haven't had to figure that out. But um, low tunnels, as I mentioned in the winter growing module and also last week's Q&A, they're kind of hard to manage. Um, it's just hard to get in there and they, they're they hard to regulate. So I don't know. Is there something natural that... Um, would take care of the slugs? I'm not sure. Maybe someone in the chat knows who's had to deal with it. Um, Pappy, oh, great. Lots of great tunnel talk. The last couple months. Yeah, absolutely. It's a big part of what I do is is using the tunnels. Do you have to get building parts for any of them in the, uh, in your locale? Um, so I did not. So I don't know. <laughs> I don't know, but from what I've heard, I it, always check with your, um, you know, your local people. From what I've heard, though, is if it's portable and not permanent, then, you know, I wouldn't worry about it. But never hurts to ask, right? Do the right thing. I mean, it helps you sleep at night. So I don't know. I don't want to say yes or no for you, for you and where you live. Uh, Marty G, let's see here. 
Oh, you're very welcome. Thanks for coming today, hanging out. You're welcome, Ed. Uh, Simone, are you worried about nitrate buildup in the crop due to suboptimal light conditions in the winter? How to circumvent this? I never really thought about that. Um, nitrate? Hmm. No, I haven't really thought about it. I mean, I put, I when I'm flipping my beds, I put in the amount of stuff that I want for basically one rotation of crop. So in the wintertime, you know, the crops are in the ground longer, but we're eventually getting the same growth out of every crop. So I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I haven't really thought about that. You know, if the crop is, is in there for the same, it's going to grow the same amount. It's going to use roughly the same amount of nutrients. So maybe it's not a big deal. Not sure. Hey, Jen, year round in a tunnel. Nice. <laughs> Mostly still under the freezing point at nights in uh, in Sweden. Yeah, you guys have a very short growing season. Sometimes I wish I had a short growing season, and then everyone who has a short growing season wishes they had a long growing season. <laughs> you guys probably know what I'm talking about. Um, sometimes I wish nature was like, "Yep, you're uh, you're done right now. You uh, it's winter time. You can't grow anything. It makes you take take some time off, work a little bit harder during the other times. But here, like we can grow all year round, so it just you don't really get a break." Uh, there you go. Uh, Hoosier Pioneer says it was pr it was a temporary structure, so you need a permit. So there you go. Again, check check with whoever you're you need to check with. Uh, Jen is a Rimmel with double poly with air off grid. Cool. Yeah, I mean, the Rimmel tunnel. I mean, it's just I have a very small one. Um, I'm going to talk about that in the next module because the next one's going to be at nursery management. So I'll talk about that nursery greenhouse a little bit. Um, yeah, they make great tunnels, totally different than, you know, the, the Caterpillar tunnels. And yeah, they do, st it does stay pretty warm. And I have a very small one, as I said, it's custom. It's like a, it's a 16 by 24. So I think if you had a bigger one, it would hold heat like way better. Um, and then Ag 70, yeah. I mean, doubling up with row cover, um, especially the Ag 70 is like really heavy duty stuff. Um, so if you put that on the, on the beds inside of a double walled or double ceilinged um, greenhouse. Yeah, you can you can push your season pretty far. That's pretty awesome. Hey, Ken. Um, what are air and ground temperatures necessary for a productive growing environment into winter tunnels? Great question. I've never measured the soil temperature. That would be interesting. Um, what I think about is obviously above freezing, right? Anything above freezing is good, um, but obviously it gets down below freezing some nights. So what does that mean? Well, uh, one thing I look at with the temperatures is if it's gonna get down to 25 or 20 or whatever, we're talking Fahrenheit here because we're in the United States, how long is it at those temperatures? Because if it's only super cold for an hour or two hours, three hours, it may not, may not be a big difference. Or like I said, the winter growing module, like if it, if it gets really cold one night versus like seven nights in a row, it's going to be different. So it's not just the temperature. It's like how long it stays at that temperature, I think is, is part of it. But I never measure the soil temperature. That should, that would be interesting to check out. So I don't know. I mean, you want to try to keep it above freezing as long as possible. Um, anything below freezing is not great. So, I mean, some crops can handle like slightly below freezing, but for extended periods of time, it will cause damage. So, um, yeah, I don't know, uh, <laughs> know about that. All right, in the process of building a 32 by 100, wow, that sounds awesome. <laughs> that is an event, that's a big tunnel. All right, uh, so I know we're coming out of winter growing, so I don't know if you guys are probably thinking about this stuff, um, but maybe you're getting excited about just growing in the wintertime, maybe making some plans for next year, because as I was already talking about today with the Q and A's, is that you really do have to plan ahead. So if you are planning a winter growing, you wanna be thinking about you know, end of summer, what you're gonna be doing in the wintertime and really making sure you have the right seeds, the right starts going, the beds open, they need to be open, in the right places, in the tunnels. Um, so winter growing, as I said, one of the biggest things is planning. 
So make sure that you are doing that well ahead of time. So as much as I say, oh, it's winter growing is silly right now, we're in April, but like come August, you're gonna start thinking about it if you're gonna be doing winter growing. So we're not that far away. And we all know how tired and stuff we are by the time it gets to August. So um, yeah, these are things that you could be thinking about now, maybe when you do have a little bit of brain space and a little bit of energy. But it was not too late or early to, <laughs> to be thinking about winter growing. Um, and also if you're, if if you are thinking about maybe starting to do some winter growing or make more of an emphasis on it, start thinking about what you want to grow in the winter time. Talk to your customers if you're if you're selling to chefs or a farmers market. Like start to get a sense of like, you know, what you might be able to want to grow and what you might be able to sell, and start thinking about those things because as you're having conversations, you know, I know with chefs, for example, they'll say like, oh, how long are you gonna have this for? And I'll say, well, I always have this, or. Um, I'm only going to have this through May or whatever. So those are things you kind of want to start thinking about if you're considering winter growing or, you know, putting more of an emphasis on it. All right. So if I'm skipping any questions, they're not related to winter growing and I'll open up for general questions at the end. Hey, Eric, two first high tunnels, 24 by 96. Man, those are awesome. Yeah, there's definitely a lot of benefit to having big tunnels. And there's also, it's a much bigger investment in terms of time, money, and land, um, and like getting it sorted out ahead of time. But bigger tunnels are way easier to manage. They're way more comfortable to work in as well. I know that like even the two tunnels we had at Raleigh City Farm, one was, I wanna say like 25 or 24 by 60. And it was like, you know, very tall inside. Like you didn't feel like you're working in a tunnel. The other greenhouse was even bigger. And so when you're in there working, you don't really feel like you're in a tunnel. Um, and that's why I said before, like I definitely went with the Gothic Pro with the extension kits. So it would just feel taller in there. But yeah, 24 by 96 is awesome. Um, here in Southern California, is that gonna be a benefit for winter or summer or? I don't know. <laughs> but yeah, tunnels are great in general, so. Especially if, yeah. Grand Outdoors, I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Really do. Um, yeah, all the supports, uh, all the support you guys give me is, is awesome, both financially and um, and uh, <laughs> emotionally. You guys have been great keeping me going here, so I do appreciate that. Um, yeah, I also didn't talk about this much, but I thought about getting a bigger tunnel um, on my space, but the bigger thing about the big tunnels, you have to definitely like level the land before you start building them. And that can be a tra challenge if you're in an area that's sloped, you have to really get some equipment in there and, and move the earth around and that can be a challenge. But man, big tunnels are so worth it. They're so, so nice. <clears throat> All right, Frankie, uh, let's see here. Are you planting fall starts in the tunnels at the same time frame you would plant them in the ground? I don't know if I understand your question. Are you planting fall starts in the tunnels the same time frame you put them in the, oh. Um, that's a great question. So like what I was saying early, I think I understand what you're saying. So like if you generally plant things three weeks apart, would you be doing the same thing? So it, again, it depends on the time of year and this takes some practice. But like I was saying, you know, once you get towards the end of summer and into early fall, it really starts slowing down. So if you planted in the summer, if you plant like a succession that you wanna plant every three weeks apart, let's say, um, if you plant them three weeks apart, like for me in October, they're gonna be ready way more than three weeks apart. So if you know that the light is and heat is starting to slow down, you might wanna plant them closer together. So in that case, you'll be starting the tra the seeds in the, in the nursery closer together too. So if you're getting towards the end and you think it's really slowing down, like usually you plant it three weeks apart, you might want to plant it a week apart or two weeks apart. So those are things you should keep track of. And then the following years, you can make adjustments. I hopefully answer your question because the time it takes, you if you want to get them in the ground um, like a week apart, then you want to start them a week apart. Also, hopefully your nursery is a little bit more consistent temperature wise in the fall than um, maybe your, your tunnels or out in the field. 
So you have to keep that in mind too. But also um, the nursery starts are going to grow more slowly if there's less light too. So that all has to get factored in, if that makes sense. Because if you plant them a week apart, let's say you plant them two weeks apart in the nursery and you're kind of in late fall. Well, if you think they're going to be, they're not going to be ready two weeks apart. They're going to be ready more than that apart because things are slowing down. Hopefully this makes sense. <laughs> Okay, extending your tomato season. Very cool. All right, so long standing spinach lived through the winter under five feet of snow in Alaska. And you planted in August. Yeah, spinach is super hardy. Uh, yeah, you'll find those crops um, that do super well. Um, one thing. I say all the time is that the winter crops taste the best, uh, in my opinion, because the cool weather, uh, the, the crops are sweeter, they're less bitter. And th the first time you taste a winter carrot, you're like never gonna want a carrot that's not grown in the winter time. They're so sweet and so delicious and juicy. Um, they're a lot less like fibrous and man, they're so good. So yeah, once you find the crops that like working in your environment in the winter time, you'll definitely, you'll know which ones are, are working for sure. Yeah, spinach is a great one. I haven't been growing it, but um, it's an awesome crop. It's also a great crop to sell because everyone knows what to do with spinach. And you can do different things. You can grow it as a baby green. You can either sell it as baby spinach and make more money off of it per pound, or you can sell it in larger spinach size for braising. So yeah, spinach is a great crop for sure. And very easy to sell because as I said, it's very familiar. I think, like I said, grow the boring crops. All right, uh, let's see here. Other winter growing questions? I'm kind of flying through questions like usual. All right, so I'll take a couple more questions on winter growing, if whatever. And then, of course, if there's more winter growing questions later, then we get into just some general questions. But again, just want to thank Paper Pod Co. for sponsoring the course and for these live sessions. I really couldn't do without their help. And please go check out what they have for sale. And get in touch with them. Let them know you're enjoying it and all that kind of stuff. And uh, I really appreciate it. But just want to give another uh, another shout out for sure. They use the sugar they produce as antifreeze. Okay, did not know why they did that, but I know that, like I've heard in carrots, for example, they convert a lot of those starches into more simple sugars. And we as humans, uh, they're sweeter to us. So there you go. I guess it's. Doesn't freeze as much? I don't know. All right. If I cut back all my spinach and leave the stems in the ground, coming with four inches of compass, will I be okay? Will the spinach try to pop through? Four inches is a lot. Um, yeah, four inches is a lot. I don't know. I've never tried that method. I, if, I, if I tried to kill any sort of baby green or, or something like that with... Um, you know, basically occultation, which is blocking from the light. I usually cover it with a tarp for a little while and it'll depend, or a piece of landscape fabric, and that'll depend on the time of year. But if you're flipping baby green beds, um, which I mentioned in whatever module that was now, uh, the, the no-till practices, I'll lay down like just a little bit of compost and wet it down and put the landscape fabric on it. In the summertime, it's one week, everything's dead. So yeah, I don't know. At this time of year, not sure. I think a lot of times, Stuff is pretty resilient. Um, some crops more than others. I haven't tried four inches of compost, but you know, one thing you could do is um, tarp it for a little while, like put a piece of landscape fabric on it, and then once it looks dead, then lay down your compost if you want to be sure. But if you're putting down four inches of compost, I'm I'm curious why you're putting down so much if you already have beds. Um, and if you are kind of redoing beds, you can always put down cardboard first if you're going to go four inches because. When I start new beds, I'm doing four to six inches. So that's that's a good amount of compost. So you could use cardboard too, which depending on the compost might actually be beneficial. Uh, hi, Sarah. Would it be possible beneficial to build a rocket mask here to heat a tunnel in the coldest part of the season? Yeah, if you can manage that, that would definitely work. I'm trying to think of, is it Osawaga Farm? I think they do some sort of crazy uh, wood stove in their greenhouse in the winter time but if I, I think it's them maybe it was another farm but they have to like get up at two in the morning go feed it more wood or whatever so 
Yeah, the, the wood thing is great, like especially if you have that resource on your property. Um, but keep in mind, you're going to have to, you know, manage it and stuff and how much is your time worth and those sorts of things. Heating tunnels, I don't have experience with, but I know that, you know, obviously if you're doing a rock and mass heater, maybe you have the fuel for it. Maybe it's not a cost thing, but maybe it's a time or energy thing. Um, you really like have to be dialed in with your stuff and really make it worthwhile because it doesn't like make things grow magically. It just kind of assists in things and keeps everything a little bit happier. So if you're really cranking along and you got a really nice greenhouse and you like know you can sell everything you can, then maybe it might be worth it. Um, the other thing I've heard, for example, um, trying to think of the farm. Sunset Market Gardens, uh, David Williams, amazing farmer. I've done a bunch of videos with David. Hopefully you're following him on Instagram too. Um, what he does is he originally started, now he's changed his model a little bit, but originally he was doing no summer growing. So kind of what I'm doing now. And he had a big um, emphasis on late winter growing. And so what he did was he'd put his tomatoes out in his greenhouses, his big greenhouses, and they are heated. And he would put them out there like super early, like way earlier than any of us normally would, But and he would heat the tunnels. And it would get him to market quicker, and he would have tomatoes when he was going to market. Now he sells mostly, I think, out of his farm store, but he would get to market a lot faster. And so he told me, he goes, it's really expensive to heat the, the greenhouses, but what I do is I interplant the tomato beds with other crops that grow pretty quickly. And so he said, by doing that, then I can pull those crops out and sell those. And that paid for the heating to get those tomatoes to market earlier. And so that justified it to him with the heating. But it can get very expensive, especially even if it's your time, like your time is worth something too, don't forget. So a long answer <laughs> to your question, but uh, it really depends on if it's worth it for you or not to manage that because, uh, or maybe it's just a couple of nights a year where it gets super cold. Um, but yeah, it's one of those things that it really depends for sure. Hey, Ken, I'm hardcore. I'm into hardcore sustainability. <laughs> nice. Uh, I'm considering using a home, a horse manure pile with an air heat exchanger system as a heat source for a tunnel next winter in zone 9b what do you what th do you think heat is needed uh depends on what you're trying to grow 9b is pretty far south um depending on what your temperatures are i don't know i've never grown in 9b i'm only i only know like where i am because that's the only place i've grown do, i mean do you get below freezing often you know um if you want to get into um that system there are some benefits to it for sure especially if you're already making compost anyways with this like you could put it next to the nursery or greenhouse and make that work. And um, I mentioned in the last q and I did a video with Sean Yadnicek at Wild Hope Farm. I think the video is called uh, Compost Heated Greenhouse. It's on the No-Till Growers channel. And he talked about a couple of their systems. He used barrels next to the greenhouse. And then they did that horse manure or cow manure. I think it was horse manure and, and bedding and stuff pile right next to it. And, you know, he, I don't know. There might be an 8A because they're a little further south than me. Maybe they're still 7B. And uh, he said it was it was worth it for them for the crops they were growing. So, um, yeah, but if it, if it gets you crops out a little bit quicker, maybe a little bit earlier and helps with your competition, you know, that's great. Or maybe it just makes a nicer place for you to work in there as you're prepping uh, beds. So if it's not a big um, cost, I don't know. It might be cool to at least play with and, and try to figure out. Um, there's a lot of, potential out there. I just haven't done it myself, so. All right, should we get into general questions? I am cool with that. What time is it? 3.30. Yeah, we can take general questions too. If you have more winter questions, I'll prioritize them, try to get those in too, but happy to take general questions. It's crazy I'm like available for you guys every Monday. This is pretty awesome. Um, I don't think it will continue after the course is over, but all right, let's see here. Mention some of your go-to crops are beets and lettuce. Can you give us variety names for winter and spring plantings? 
Beets, as I mentioned in the crop selection module, I grow red ace. They're the most boring, basic red beet. That's the only one I use. And for lettuce, I use the Salanova Foundation Mix from Johnny's. So it's a mixture of four varieties. I grow it all year round. It's uh, green sweet crisp, red sweet crisp, green insides, and red insides. But you can buy the mix or you can buy all four and mix them together. Um, I just grow the same thing. And as I said, I'm not growing in the summer. So um, yeah, that's all, I, that's all I've been growing. But if I were to like be focusing on win, uh, summer lettuce production, I might switch varieties because there's others that do better. Uh, Mir is my favorite, M-U-I-R. That's my favorite uh, summer lettuce. But I was also growing um, Cherokee and Magenta. Those are two other good ones. Very different kind of lettuce than the Salanova, uh, much bigger, heavier leaf lettuce. And I switched over to doing Salanova because it um, it's a little fancier looking and the restaurants seem to like it. But in terms of eating, I don't know, I'll go back and forth. I'm kind of getting tired of Salanova because I eat it every week because I grow it. But um, yeah, maybe I should grow some other stuff at some point, but it's been working uh, and the restaurants like it. And it seems like my accounts are either taking the same amount or more every single week. So it's pretty awesome. All right, uh, let's get some questions going here, guys. Open up for general questions, as I said, whatever you want to talk about. Farming related. Sometimes people come in here and ask me questions about cameras and stuff too. Um, let's see here. Yeah, the snow insulation thing is real. Uh, I don't have that, like, I don't want to say luxury, but experience maybe is a better word. <laughs> Thanks for showing up today, everybody, hanging out. Let me know what you guys want to talk about. It doesn't have to be winter growing. Oh, I'm just scrolling back up. Grand Outdoors. Um, uh, you're very welcome. Um, it's been cool. I mean, let me back up a second. So it's been really interesting for me with my YouTube channel because I recently crossed over 200,000 subscribers, which is crazy and mind blowing to me for so many reasons. But I think back on the reasons why I started the YouTube channel in the first place. And I don't, I, not everyone knows like how the whole thing started and everything. But for me, I was on Instagram to market my farm for a year and I started getting a lot of technical questions. And so when I started the YouTube channel, I was really like just sharing what I knew. I was a very new farmer. I still am a fairly new farmer as far as I'm concerned. Um, you know, you, you think you're like, you know a lot and then you talk to someone who's been doing it five or 10 years long and you're like, I don't know anything. So it's good to be humble about that. But I, you know, when I started the channel, it was really to share my experience, share what I know, show what doesn't work, show what does work. And I'm kind of still doing that. Um, and so it's been great to be able to continue to share these things and now to take everything I've experienced and learned and and developed into my little system on this little farm and be able to share it in a package for everybody, I think is super cool because it is one model. There are infinite models essentially, um, but it's something that you can use. And I've really tried to focus on giving all of you a framework to think through so that I'm not just like, here's the playbook one through a hundred, here are all the steps, but like how you can go about thinking about it and making it work for your farm. Because I think when I started farming, I didn't th like think about why things were happening. I was like, just tell me what to do. And I just tried to repeat it. And then when it didn't work, I didn't understand why it didn't work because I didn't really understand what was going on. So that's kind of what I've been trying to do is, is provide that sort of framework and thinking so that everyone can understand it for themselves and then like apply it to their situation because it's always so different. Anyways, <laughs> uh, the question here is about size of bags when transporting larger amounts of greens. I have one bag. Um, I buy it from Uline. There is my last how to sell to chefs video. Go check that out. There's a link in that video for bags. Um, I don't know the name of the bag off the top of my head or the size. 
It, I do, I, that's, I only have one bag and it's like two pounds of lettuce fit in there. I could probably squeeze two and a half, but I just do two pounds of greens. I could put like 10 pounds of beets in there, 10 pounds of carrots. Like it, I have one bag. It's like a heavy duty um, gusseted, like it's, it like opens up on the bottom. And one thing I have to say about bags is we all hate plastic, but we have to accept that like that's the best way to transport our, our products um, in a way that's safe for the products and keeps them fresh. And I've even thought about, and I have tried thinner bags. The problem with thinner bags is obviously, you know, it's like less plastic and they're cheaper, but they rip way more often. And the, I got, I finally upgraded to heavier bags and I don't rip anymore. So I used to throw away a whole bunch of bags because I thought I was saving money in plastic by getting smaller bags. But I know one restaurant takes the bags I, I give them and they reuse them for prepping fish or something. I forget what it is. They like reuse them. That's like part of their whole system now because they buy so much lettuce from me that they reuse them for something, for some sort of prep for brunch on Sunday or I don't, I forget what it was. I'm just making that up. Um, so I don't remember the bag off the top of my head, but that's, that's where you can find that for sure. And I'll, I'll post it in future videos too, but um, <clears throat> it's from Uline. All right, let me scroll back down here. See, there's more questions. Hi, Jen. Um, so go watch my no-till practices module. I use a fertilizer mix that I mix up and compost. Um, I go through all the details there. So yes, I use it on every bed flip. Let's see here. So that is module six. Hey, Eric, uh, where do I buy irrigation supplies? Funny you ask. That is on Thursday's module. Um, I bought them from a few places. I have had pretty good luck with all of them. Not sponsored by any of them. Um, so one is uh, Farmer's Friend because, well, I have been sponsored by them before, but um, I bought their overhead irrigation kit from them. But for general irrigation supplies, I've used uh, Drip Depot, Dripworks, and Berry Hill. Um, I've recently been buying from Berry Hill because they're in Virginia, so it's pretty close to me. But I've had decent luck with all of them. So those are the three, Drip Depot, Dripworks, and Berry Hill. Um, yeah, I don't know. That's where I've been buying from. And some stuff I'll get at Home Depot or Lowe's if it's stuff that they carry. But generally, you know, those are, the, those are my go-tos. Hey, Bonnie. All right. Let's see here. Hey, Jen. Thank you so much. And one other thing I, I know I was like kind of um, just kind of reflecting on the, on the YouTube channel and stuff, but most of you probably know I taught high school math for five years and I really do miss teaching. And so for me, this has become a teaching outlet for me, even though I don't get to like interact with with you, with all of you out there and like think of you as my students, I still get to like talk and explain and and, and that part of my brain gets fired up and it, it is awesome. So um, I, I appreciate that for sure. And I did get to recently go and speak to um, my friend Jody teaches at uh, NC State. So I went and got and talked to her class recently. It was like super cool. I'd been in front of a classroom of kids in a while. It was really neat. Um, all right, how many hours of sun do your high tunnels get in the fall? I never measure this stuff. I probably should, people always ask me. Um, I don't get enough light in my backyard. It is too shaded. Um, in the summer, I'd say the shoulder seasons are good. I would say the summer and the winter, I don't get enough uh, sun. I know that sounds silly in the summer, but that's why I never put shade cloth on because I think the sunlight doesn't match the amount of heat that I get. So to me, the shoulder seasons are usually generally when things are growing really well, like the, the plants look the happiest. So um, that's one thing in my system here that doesn't work great because there's just so many trees around. You guys have seen plenty of photos and drone shots and stuff. Um, it makes it a little tough. Um, so I don't know, I don't have a number for you, Tiny House. I, I don't, I'm sorry. And the other thing is, certain areas of the tunnel get, get more or less sunlight during the day, I feel like. Like maybe the middle gets the most amount of sun. I'm not sure. 
Hey, Joy. Uh, favorite brand names for 1020 trays. So, I don't know which 1020 trays. I don't know which 1020 trays you're looking for. I now am using only soil blocks. So I use these like uh, soil block basket things. I got them from Johnny's. Uh, if you go to the go to my YouTube channel, I see, <laughs> I see this in every live. But if you go to the YouTube channel on the upper right, there's a search section. You can search for any topic you want. Um, if you look at the soil blocking video, there's a link in there for the, the trays that I use. In terms of if you're using plug trays, I haven't bought plug trays in a while. I'm not really sure. Um, there was a company that I was buying trays from for microgreens and they went out of business. That was frustrating. So there are a lot of options out there, but um, I don't know right now. I haven't looked for 10, 20 trays in a few years, so I'm not really sure if you're talking about it like... Um, you know, plug trays. Although if I were to get to be doing not soil blocks, I'd probably wind up going the windstrip route. Um, but I'm a huge fan of soil blocks now. I am definitely converted and not going back. Um, so yeah. Hey, Papio, you mentioned a while possible greens bar manifold project with farmer's friend. That is a great, great question. Um, I am still using, all right, so if you guys don't know this, I guess I mentioned this in some video forever ago. Uh, Farmer's Friend was working on a, um, a greens bubbler kit to sell and they asked me to, to trial out a prototype and I'm, st I'm still using the prototype and they've, I don't know if they've abandoned it or they're revisiting it. They basically put on hold. I think it was partially because they were moving into a new facility and it was just crazy with COVID and moving buildings and setting up this whole thing. So um, they put it on pause. I think they might be going back after it a little bit. I'm not sure. I, it sounded like I got an email from Jonathan a few weeks ago that maybe they're working on it again. So yeah, it, I didn't really like the design so much. Um, I'm going to talk about it in the, um, when I go through my wash station for a while, they were like, don't show this to anyone. Cause they, they were just working on it. But I asked and they said, it's fine. So yeah, it's, it's a different design where the water comes in from the bottom, sorry, the air comes in from the bottom instead of like over the top. I much prefer it over the top. Uh, it's just a lot more simple. This has other issues that I have to deal with, but otherwise, um, the manifold itself is not a big deal. It's kind of like whatever you can kind of use anything for a manifold, as long as it kind of covers the whole space and you have you know, roughly the amount of, right amount of holes. And so that, that was sort of the big difference there. They also had an idea where they were gonna fill from the bottom, or sorry, through the side. So they just didn't wanna have any like hoses or anything in the inside the greens tank was sort of the goal. That did not pan out whatsoever. I went back, to, just they didn't even send me the right part. So like I just wound up using um, my old setup, which was just like a piece of PVC pipe with a with the Hudson float valve for the fill, and that just that just works so well. It's just so bomb proof. So yeah, I, I guess that product got abandoned, but I'm still <laughs> still using the prototype because it was like right at the beginning of the season, and I was like, I don't have time to do something else. I just been using it, so it's been working okay. There's nothing really like unique about it. Um, I think any sort of PVC setup with holes in it would probably work. Hey, Marty, uh, let's see here. Uh, Post-harvest washing lettuce. How do you throw your clean lettuce of small bugs, aphids, white flies, et cetera? I have triple base sink. Yeah, it's the bubbler for me. So I will bubble and that pretty much gets rid of everything. You bubble it and let it sit for a second and most things kind of drop out. Um, and then for me, if I do wind up having uh, greens that have either lots of I don't know, dirt, well, that doesn't really happen for me, but if there are a bunch of bugs on it, aphids, white fly, whatever, um, I'll just change out the water frequently, but the bubbling definitely helps a lot. Like it, it definitely takes care of a good amount of it, but I'll notice like, especially right now, uh, we're coming out of pollen season. We have incredible amount of pine pollen here. So like everything's covered in green, including all the crops. And so when I go and wash the lettuce, um, the water will turn green. So I just have to change the water more often. That's sort of the only way around it. Um, but the bubbler works really, really well. Um, and bubblers aren't expensive. I mean, the tank is maybe 80 or $100. Uh, the pump's $100. You can build a stand out of whatever wood you have laying around, basically. Maybe a little bit of money. Um, you know, it's, it's not a ton of money to build a bubbler. It's totally worth it. Um, it saves so much time and just gets everything so much cleaner. So 
Highly recommend the bubbler. But that's it. That's the big trick for me is just changing out the water frequently. You know, like I'm usually might have to only change the water every, I don't know, th th three bins of lettuce versus now I've changed every one and a half to two bins of lettuce. So, so, you know, you, maybe I could do 30 pounds at once. Now I can only do 15 or 20 at once if there's stuff on the greens. Hey, Jen. Yeah, I love the hose links. Um, they have sponsored the channel, so, but as I said, they're not sponsoring this video. Uh, I have one on each side, and I talk about that in the um, the module coming on Thursday for sure. Hand watering is crucial. You got to be able to pull a hose out and water things sometimes. Part time climbers, nice. Um, yeah, that'll be on Thursday. Irrigation, I go through, let's see here. Uh, overhead versus drip and like why you want to use one or the other or both. Um, working in your farm design, I talk about water sources, running lines on your farm, timers. I go specifically about like my overhead drip system, uh, uh, overhead system, then the drip system, hand watering, and then irrigation sourcing. So kind of the stuff we've been talking about today, but it'll all be wrapped up in, uh, in one video. So that'll be coming out. And again, as I said before, if you're anxious to get a jump on thinking about things, use the search. Um, thing on the on my YouTube channel. If you look up irrigation, you'll find all sorts of videos. The last version of my irrigation system video is called How I Water My Plants. So if you want to look that up and just get a head start, um, you'll get a sense of what's going on there. Uh, thank you, Tiny House. Yeah, you. I work on bullet points, so I don't... Um, I mean, it's pretty obvious. I don't script things, but I definitely work on bullet points. That's how I've been getting through this whole course. I actually want to make a video about how I make these videos. I'm going to do that for my other channel for sure. Um, bullet points of, is definitely my, my go-to. And um, you know what's a great tip? I'll give you this tip right now. If any of you guys are um, Apple users, the Notes app on your phone is incredible because it syncs with your computer and it's super easy to use. So like I'll... Um, when I go to write up an outline for a module or even a, a general video if I'm doing like a, a tech kind of video for my other channel, I'll write up all the points there on my computer when I can sit there and process it and then it's already on my phone and I use that. So, um, and then leave. <laughs> so yeah, bullet points are awesome. Um, it's enough for me. Otherwise I forget a few points, but you can see, especially in the module, like I can talk for five minutes at a time if I have talking points. So that works out great. Oh, pizza. I am not Mr. Satin. That, that Mr. Satin does not exist anymore. Uh, I have not tried adding vinegar. I just use water. Uh, shot vac exhaust for bubblers. Some people have done that. Um, I just think about like what else is your shop vac like blowing through like it's it's a shop vac it's not super clean so i have a dedicated blower it's a jacuzzi pump blower um in some of my wash station videos i've made several versions of that they're they're like 90 or 100 bucks maybe 110 bucks um i really just recommend one and just has a dedicated thing for sure again if you're running a commercial farm in any sense like a few hundred dollar investment in your wash station is totally worth it like just figure out how to get the right tool for the right job. Uh, tiny house and not, ugh, more questions, tiny house. Let's see here. Um, I didn't mean to sound uh, negative. I'm just, all right. You able to supply your restaurants throughout the winter or about what date you stopped selling the winter? So there was only one week, I believe I didn't sell to them during the winter. And we just had a series of super cold nights and the crops just looked like crap. And they were fine, they rebounded, but there was just like a couple of cold nights that led up to the day I had to harvest and I just looked at everything and I was just like, it's not gonna happen this week. And then the next week it all rebounded. Like like the kale was all super hanging down, the lettuce didn't look great and it was fine like the next week. Um, and then, yeah, there was that. And then when I went on vacation a few weeks ago, but otherwise, yeah, I had lettuce uh, throughout the winter. I had carrots until I don't know, maybe February. Um, those 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 were great in the winter time to just keep pulling carrots out of the ground. 
Uh, beets were on and off, but uh, my main thing was lettuce, and I had kale like all winter. So lettuce and kale was like every week for sure. Uh, I didn't have trouble trouble with those. Uh, can't find a good example of how to figure time to leave on. I know it's situational, but no example how to figure that. So are you, t- are you talking about like irrigation, I'm guessing? Um, yeah, so I talk about this in the module, but basically I'm assuming you're talking about like the time you set for each round of irrigation, like overhead drip, whatever. <laughs> no, that's cool. Questions are fine. <laughs> I don't know why. <laughs> Never mind. It's all good, Tiny. I'd call you Tiny, Tiny House. I don't know what your name is, but um, let's see here. Uh, the, what I say is like pick a time and um, just monitor it. Like run it for a couple days and then you'll know if it's too much or too little. And then just make a small adjustment and wait. You're like, it's like trying to steer a large ship. Like you can't just like, it's not like driving a race car, right? You can't just like make a quick turn. You make a turn and then you kind of have to wait for it to happen. So you kind of have to anticipate a little bit. So you start running it for a couple days. You'll see, is it too much or too little? And then you make an adjustment and then you wait a couple more days, those sorts of things. If you're outside, it's a completely different story because you're gonna get rain. If you're in a tunnel, you have a lot more control. And then you might go, okay, well, you know, 30 minutes a day works great. And then, um, then it might start getting into summertime and then you're like, okay, it's not enough water. And then you start extending it a little bit. So again, farming is not set it and forget it. It never is. Like you always have to use your senses, like go out and put your hands in the soil, feel the soil, look at the plants, see how they're doing and uh, make a judgment call. Like that's what you have to do. Um, You wanna make sure it's wet, but it's not soaking wet, right? You wanna make sure that there's enough airflow that it dries out a little bit. It's one of those things that you have to use your senses and make adjustments over time. But start with something and then see how it goes and then make changes. That's the best way to do it. And then just keep an eye on it because it will change throughout the year. Um, Oh, nice, Eric said that. Eric knows what's up. (laughs) Eric's the man, such a great farmer, such a cool dude too. I did get to interview Eric for when I was doing Growers Live. Um, If you guys saw that, I was doing a show every other week on no-till growers where I interviewed farmers from all over the world and interacted with people in the chat. So I got to have Eric on there. We had a good conversation. So cool dude. Hope to go visit him some point. Kinsey. Okay, cool. Thanks, Kinsey. Uh, Papio, you're very welcome. I appreciate you for uh, the support. One kale plant, there's always six... 6B snow. Yeah, sometimes kale, get, some of these crops can be really resilient. Um, and sometimes they're hard to terminate. Like sometimes you can cut them off. Um, and like, if it's not like below soil level, they'll just keep regrowing. So kale is, kale is ser- it can get seriously large too, for sure. All right. Your ear, uh, doing the winter crops, I guess you'll be working on the farm through the end of August and wrapping up the end. Yeah, so I haven't decided on my time frame. Um, I know that I'm gonna be done sort of by the end of June. That's the goal because that's when my kids get out of school for the summer. And so I wanna align with them. So that's my time frame there. But if, uh, if my crops don't make it till then or I run out of food, like it is what it is. I'm kind of winding down already. I have a couple more things to plant, um, some lettuce and some beets, um, maybe a little bit of radish, we'll see, uh, depending on one restaurant wants some. And that's it for my planting. I mean, we're May May 2nd right now and end of June, I'm done. So kind of running out of time here. Um, I do have one more round of stuff to transplant, which I wanna <laughs> use to, to do my module also, but I'll have a last cropping of lettuce and beets. So. That'll be great for that. So that's the plan. Uh, Starting out in the fall, I have no idea. I am not even gonna think about it yet. Um, 
it's one of those things where I only need a certain amount of time to get going. So the bigger thing is me prepping the beds, but those are probably going to be prepped at um, in June. And we're going to like, I'll make a video about it, whatever we wind up doing, but we're going to um, put down a bunch of material and then pull the tarps over it and let it just hang out for the summer. And so I will, I'll try to document that to, to show you what I do to put the beds to sleep for the winter, or for, for the winter, for the summer. And they should be pretty much ready to go when we pull the tarp off. I can just start planting. But the bigger thing is when do I start seeding out transplants in the fall? How early I can do that with the heat? Um, because that can be a challenge here if it's, you know, August, September. It's really hot here. So I'm not sure on the timing yet in the fall. I have to figure that out. But I'm just trying to get through the end of the, end of the spring here. I think that's my, my first goal. All right. What other questions do you guys have? Uh, while we're hanging out. <laughs> Dog is barking. Kinsey, do you have more questions? <laughs> um, and then the other thing about the, the summer plans, I only have enough tarp to cover two tunnels. So the the idea is to cover crop the third tunnel, and then as soon as we pull back one tarp in the fall, we'll cover the cover crop residue with that and then break that down. That's the plan. We'll see what happens in six to eight weeks. We'll see how I feel and what's going on, but that's, that's the ideal world right now, for sure. All right, let's see here. <laughs> Uh, my dog's name is Mira, M-I-R-A. Um, but we're taking care of my mother-in-law's dog right now. Her name is Muppet. Well, that's not her real name. That's what we call her. She looks like a Muppet. Um, <laughs> let's see here. So, guys, coming up, just to give you a heads up. Um, so if you're thinking ahead a little bit, I said irrigation. Then I'm going to do a bunch of seeding stuff. So seed propagation, nursery management, and then um, direct seeding, transplanting, and then tools and supplies, pest and weed management, harvesting, and then composting. So kind of a lot more to come in the course. Uh, it's definitely a lot more material. I'm really excited to get, as I said, wrap this all up in a package for people. So whoever wants to watch this at any time can just go through and, and watch the course. So hope you guys have been enjoying it. And um, let's see here. <laughs> Yeah, it was cool. To, it's always cool to catch people live for sure. And these stay up live. And I've noticed that a lot of people watch or listen to them later too, which is always fascinating to me, but they do stay up as well. So if you're ever curious like um, about a certain question, obviously you can come to a live session, but um, often it, I think a lot of the stuff that we need to talk about that I either forgot to talk about or people have questions about will get brought up during the live. And you can always listen to those later. So those stay up on YouTube as well. Not me. Yeah, not not Mira. Me I think that's pronounced Mir, right? Like I think of John Mir, like as in the environmentalists and the John Mir Trail and stuff. So that's how I first pronounce it. M-U-I-R. All right, cool. Well, I guess I'll wrap this up if there's no more questions. Um, again, we'll see you every Monday at 3 p.m. Eastern. And these stay up uh, for, as I said, for you guys to watch. So thanks for tuning in. Thanks for the support. Thanks again for Paper Pot Co. for sponsoring this. And... Uh, Let's see, we got one more question. Happy to answer that. I don't soak any seed in it before I direct seed. Um, so yeah, people call that priming. Um, I've heard it's helpful for some crops like spinach, with maybe, or, or peas, uh, especially in warmer times when you wanted to get them to germinate a little bit quicker. But I haven't done any of that. Um, and again, the only thing I'm direct seeding right now is carrots. So I think that'd be kind of a mess to, um, to, to soak those beforehand. Nice. Get everyone hooked on it. Uh, all right, guys. Again, thank you so much. We'll see you guys soon.